you have the Bible wheel. I fully recommend that you, you study it based on that. I did it many times reading the Bible in the pattern of the Bible wheel. I love it. It's very enjoyable. I believe that it has God's divine fingerprint on it. But I, I feel really, really bad today because of this, what this guy wrote. I can't imagine somebody going from theism to pantheism. I, I, I simply can't imagine it. And obviously he has never had appropriate training in the nature of God. He must have read some goofy psychological thing or, or whatever other reason and he's departed. And it, it, it breaks my heart. But anyway, I bring that up because I brought it up in this class before and I don't want somebody at some point to go to that site and say, what is Charlie doing? And I'm also recording it for anybody that you know watches that, that they know I no longer want people to go to the Bible Wheel website and uh, I'll announce it on uh, Saturday too because I just don't want that kind of stuff getting out other than to be Acknowledge that he has done this. Oh, terrible. Was that? Yeah, here, let me give you one. Um, anyway, uh, if anybody knows where we were in Genesis, we can start with that now. Um, let me get you a copy of that while I'm, uh, what is that, 20? Chapter oh, chapter 23. All right, now what did I, I just had. Yeah. Okay, before we what? Before we get to the back there. It's going this journey where it says, if we deny him, he will deny us. Yes. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. Yes. So he cannot deny who he is. He, well, yours says he cannot deny who he is. Uh, that New King James Version says he cannot deny himself. That's a little clear. In other words, if you have called on Jesus, you have become a part of the body of Christ. Right? He can't deny that. He cannot deny himself. We are now in Christ positionally the moment that we call on him. And he can't deny that without saying. In other words, it says in the book of Ephesians that the moment we believe, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. God has now put his seal on us and we are eternally his. And so for him to change his mind about what he has done is impossible. He can't deny that he has sealed us with the Holy Spirit. In other words, eternal salvation. And I, you know, real quickly, I'll tell you what, I was doing uh, the daily Bible verse for five days from now, and we're going to go through real quickly what I typed, and that'll, maybe that'll help with this. Um, this is in uh, 1 John chapter 2. He says, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children because you have known the father. Okay, and then he goes on from there. But those three verses are actually two verses which are one triplet. Um, he is writing to little children, to fathers, and to um, young men, and then to little children again. Does this mean he's writing to people that are uh, different ages? Or until, until I typed this today, I never had any opinion on it. That's why I like doing this daily devotionals because it helps me as much as it, it uh, may help others. But uh, the first, when he writes to you, I write to you little children. He says, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. The word he uses there is technia, T-E-K-N-I-A, all right? It's a term for little children that he uses elsewhere as an endearing term. I write to you little children because you are forgiven for his name's sake. He's saying that as little children in Christ, you understand that you have been forgiven your sins. Okay? I don't believe he's writing to people age-wise. I believe he's writing to people in doctrine. Okay? The reason why is we'll go on and you'll discover why in just a second. He says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. This is a mature Christian that understands not only that he's been forgiven. Let, let, let's give you an example before I go on. I go to a little child and I say, do you know you've done wrong? Yes. Do you know that you need to be punished for that? Yes. Little children understand this. Do you know that Jesus will forgive you of your sins and he will give you eternal life? And they'll say, oh yes. That's all a little child knows is that they have been forgiven. They don't know anything doctrinally about who Jesus is. They don't know anything other than, I'm forgiven. I have eternal life. And little children know this. Okay, so he says, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven. You little children in Christ, I'm writing to you. You know your sins are forgiven. And then he says, I write to you fathers. He goes to the mature people. And he says, because you have known him who is from the beginning. In other words, their doctrine is sound enough where they know that he is the eternal God who stepped out of time 
and united with human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you now, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. So he's not writing to people in age because a lot of old people in the church have no idea the, the depth of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. All they know is that they've been forgiven, right? So he's obviously writing to mature people regardless of age. Then he goes, I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. Well, what's the logical progression? I understand my sins are forgiven, and now I understand that I have defeated the devil. Well, you don't defeat the devil and then get your sins forgiven. So what he's doing is he's making a logical, orderly argument for the work of Jesus Christ by addressing different ages of people. But he's not doing it in order. Okay? Then you get to the third couplet, or third of the triplet, and it says here, I write to you little children because you have known the Father. He does not use the same term, technia, as he did the first time. In the first I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven. It's the word technia. Down here, I think it's epinia. I, I, I'm forgetting the word right now. But um, he writes to an entirely different category of little children because you have known the Father. He's still writing to believers, but these are people that only know God the Father because of God the Son. They don't even know their sins are forgiven. In other words, we preach in this church eternal salvation. I have been forgiven and I understand that I am eternally forgiven. A little child can know that. But an even younger child knows that they're forgiven. They know the Father, but they don't know that their salvation is eternal. In other words, go to the Church of God, which I bring up from time to time, how they believe that you can lose your salvation. That is doctrinally immature. That is very, very immature to believe that. And that's why he uses a different term for little children. He's saying that people that know that their sins are forgiven, even if they know the, 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 the depth of who Jesus Christ is, if they say you can lose your salvation, then actually they don't know the depth of who Jesus Christ is. Because he is ever faithful to us. And that is what I'm saying about Timothy, is that he is saying he can't deny himself. It's impossible. But somebody that says that they can lose their salvation, doesn't matter how much theology they have, they are absolutely immature. All they know is the love of God the Father through Jesus, but they don't know anything beyond that. Do you see the logical? Yeah. He, he's going in different order to make sure that we understand he's not writing to actual aged people, he's writing to people that are aged in their understanding of the mystery of Christ. Spiritually. Spiritually. That's right. And I never, never thought that until I sat down and typed that this morning. And finally that verse makes sense to me because, you know, you read a verse a million times unless you actually study, there's a huge difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible. Yes. What we do in here on Monday morning is studying the Bible. And so I learn as much sitting in this class as I've ever learned, in the, like in the book of Genesis. I can tell you, I walk out of here, I'll watch that video as I'm processing it, and I think, I never knew that. And yet, I'm the one that says it. Isn't that bizarre? And it happens week after week after week. I'm, because we learn to unpackage things when we study them. Yet, yeah, what? Because God's speaking. Because God is speaking, absolutely. And we are analyzing and revering His Word for what it is. Yeah. Which... Which children was the technia? Technia is the first one. They understand their... Verse, verse 1. one. Okay. Yes. And I believe the word is epinia. I, I may be wrong. On that. I'm sorry. I, I have completely forgot the, uh, the word and I don't want to use the wrong word. So okay. don't write it down. But the second one is saying, you know the Father. Well, just because... How do, how do we know the Father? Through we, the Son. Through the Son. So we can say, I love God the Father because of the Son. And if that's as far as we go, he's saying that... Your sins are forgiven, but they, you don't even understand that. Mm -hmm. You don't even understand the depth of eternal salvation. And that's what I believe he's trying to say there. So he's making a logical, orderly proclamation. Your sins are forgiven. You're at this point. You know him who is from the beginning. You're at this point. And then he says, you know, uh, what was the third one? Uh, I write these things so that um, uh, young men, so that you... Because you defeated the, you de defeated the wicked one. So he's going, sins are forgiven, defeated the wicked one, know him who is from the beginning. And then he goes all the way back down to the bottom and he says, you know the Father. Big deal almost compared to the, the depth of the people that know that they are eternally saved. And not only that, but they understand this because of the work of this glorious God who stepped out of time in the person of Jesus Christ. And in other words, you can know that you're eternally saved and still not understand the depth of Jesus Christ. Yes? Isn't there... To me, in my mind, there's a connection there with 
God dealing with his with the Jews. Because yes, that could be his because covenant, his promise to the Jews. Right, they know the Father, but they no don't. No matter what they do, he, there's going to be a remnant saved. That's right, but the remnant, the remnant will always know who Jesus is mm -hmm. in this dispensation. Mm -hmm. The remnant yeah. that was saved in the past was saved because of faith in right. what God was saying through the law right. of Moses. But they God's faithfulness in both. He keeps us. Right. Just as he's going to keep his covenant with. The Jews, he That's right. But those who are in the remnant of the Jews are going to be in exactly the same p position as the Christians, one of those four categories. Okay. They may know that they're forgiven through Jesus. They uh -huh. may know the Father through Jesus, but they may not know the deeper teachings of Christ. Right. But one way or another, if I, I don't know if that helps you with that, but Jesus Christ cannot deny himself. And if somebody is called on him, even this guy that wrote this nonsense here, yeah. as far as I read the Bible, he is eternally saved, but he will pay a huge penalty Amen. for his lack of faithfulness, his lack of perseverance. You know what? Woo. I'm sitting there this morning feeling, feeling miserable, and I'm yeah. thinking if I feel miserable, and I understand at least a portion of the Bible, what about the people that just go there and they think, isn't this cool, and wow, is, and all of a sudden they're, 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 they're disillusioned. Yes. Maybe they w aren't saved, and now they, they won't be saved because of this guy's work. I mean, Terrible. As I said, and I'll say it one time, and then we'll get started in Genesis 23, bad doctrine does not keep a person from being saved. Bad doctrine keeps the next person from being saved. So we need to remember that. What is if that you didn't know about this guy? And you just went on about your life. Then he has no bearing on you. He's just, this guy has no bearing on anything. I mean, he's, this is just a guy, and that's why I say, you know what? I, I almost, and I got to tell you, what I almost did this morning, and I thought, I can't do it. I almost walked in here and started to say the things he was saying as if I really believed it. And I thought, I want to give you a, yeah, I, you know, but I thought, I can't do that. I mean, I, I, I just couldn't even get myself to practice it. You know, I, I, I just would feel so morally unclean when I left here. Yes. It would make a great example for you, and you'd think, you know, but at first I could just imagine you being horrified. But just imagine the people that know this person that have relied on him for doctrine and for instruction, and now, you know, that, and that's what I feel like. I, I, you know, very bizarre, very, very bizarre. Yeah, well, I know it, it but it, it, it's painful because he's somebody that I know personally and that I've dealt with. And like I say, I wouldn't feel any more shocked if, if Seth and Jared together got up and said, you know, we, we, we have did a study this week, and we have determined that what we've been teaching is incorrect. And can you imagine? Can you imagine the church? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, it would be like probably a 50-50. There are people in the church that would stay and say, you know what? They, they, they've come to some new revelation. Look at, look at what's his name? Charles Taz Russell, Russell with the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. That's how they started. Bible study. And they came to this magnificent conclusion that people had been reading the Bible wrong for 1,800 years. And people stayed and they've grown. So a certain portion of the people would stay at grace. And they'd say, we have a new teaching. Because people like the new thing. They like the, the, yeah. But you know what? Then there would be the people that would just be out of here. They would have stood up and gotten out. Or maybe they would have stayed for the whole sermon and then had a giant argument afterward. But, you know, that's why I say, and I say it, I try to say it week after week after week, do not trust me. I could be this guy three weeks from now. You know, I could have a, a brain aneurysm or something, a chemical, I don't know what caused this is what I'm saying. I could be this person in two weeks. And if I am, you can't trust me because your faith will be harmed for something that you have misdirected your faith and said, what a great guy Charlie is. I'm not. I'm just a lughead that is trying to search through these scriptures the same as everybody else. And I could be. I, I know I could be this person. I don't know how it could happen, but it could happen. And every one of us needs to evaluate ourselves continuously. Are we heading in this direction? And what is the verse? I, I've said it. Some of you will know it. What is my favorite verse in the Bible? My favorite verse. Hebrews, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Don't fix your eyes on the Bible wheel. Don't fix your eyes on Richard Emil, however you say his last name. Don't fix your eyes on your Bible teacher or on Seth or on Grace Baptist Church or on anything. You fix your eyes on Jesus and you will be secure. You may be miserable in life, but you will be secure. All right, sorry to divert so far, but this was really important to me, especially because I brought this guy's name into this class, and I still hold 
that that is divinely inspired. I mean, it's the Bible without any changes, and it's just simply rolled up, and it comes out with this beautiful thing. It's not from the universal collective conscious. It's from the mind of God. <laughs>